Thanks so much uh, for having me, for inviting me, for coming out late at night, for coming to a talk instead of a spoken word performance. I'll try to do some spoken word if I can get it in there. And I have to say especially a shout out to Bilal Ansari, Chaplain Bilal Ansari, who is um, an old friend. And this is a wonderful opportunity to see him again. And I have to say, we're also Facebook friends. So I'm kind of like watching what's going on up here um, on your campus from afar. Um, and so it's really great. I, I, I was so impressed with the events that happened today, and I'm just so honored um, to be invited to be part of Claiming Williams. Um, so let me just um, say a little bit um, about, uh, really what I want to do today is just tell you a little bit about who I am and um, what I've been obsessed with for the last 10 years, which is this book project and research um, uh, on these questions around um, citizenship and American Muslims. Um, and, uh, and this is the book that was the, was the result of that uh, 10 years of labor, which I'm happy to sign. And I have to tell you that if you check out page 330, you might recognize uh, somebody um, there. Um, so I hope you will take a look, and I'm happy to sign books afterwards if you're interested. Uh, and so um, the questions that the book tackles are questions that I really knew very intimately growing up as a kid, a Muslim American kid in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, but I'm sure that there are also questions that you know, that you're very familiar with, even if you don't know any Muslims. Um, because frankly, these are questions that we hear all the time about Islam. You know, can uh, Islam exist in the modern world? Uh, does it need to be reformed, changed, and how? Um, can someone be Muslim and American? And also, what is American citizenship? So this is also a question that came out I don't know how many of you were watching the Super Bowl, or at least you probably heard about the Twitter crisis post-Super Bowl um, around the Coke commercial, right, that featured this young girl, um, but more importantly had uh, people, various immigrant uh, communities in the U.S., American immigrants, who were singing America the Beautiful in their languages. Now this um, was upsetting to some people, I see some of the tweets here. Um, and presumably, you know, most of these uh, tweeters are, you know, not like middle-aged bigots or something. You know, often we think of like race as like a generational problem, but in fact, a lot of these are also, you know, millennials, young people who, who, um, you know, are have a very different vision of uh, what Americanness um, means. And so, to me, um, sort of listening to this conversation about this Coke ad, and I'm. I guess you know what side I'm on. Um, although I actually am not a fan of Coke. This is just to keep me awake this late at night. Um, but but um, in any case, the, 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 that, that was not even planned. That's just a coincidental. So everything comes together all of a sudden. Um, uh, in any case, the, the, you know what, what I think about when I think of this debate uh, is really about this distinction that we often don't think about, the difference between legal citizenship, right, just having the status of I'm a citizen, right, which is a legal status, technical status, and um, social citizenship, you know, having the privilege of being recognized as American, right, um, which is not a technical status, it's a social status, right, and, um, you know, maybe that's not something that we always think about, we think, you know, we just sort of think of like citizenship <laughs> equals passport, but for many people living in this country, they may have that passport, but they don't have uh, the social recognition of being American. They don't get to stand for the nation. Uh, as, you know, Koch puts this girl forward as standing for America, and that's upsetting to some people. Now, the place that I grew up uh, in, in Detroit, Michigan, where there's actually very, very large American Muslim populations, this is something that's just like a normal part. We all know that. In other words, uh, the, this part of the country, you have an Arab community um, that's been there for generations. So their grandparents were uh, legal, legal immigrants to the U.S. Um, I said legal immigrants. So there's, you know, citizenship is, legal citizenship is not up for grabs, but they also understand that they may have a thick Mid Midwestern accent, they may have those flat Michigan A's, uh, they may love, you know, football and all those things, but for many people they're not considered American. They don't have that social privilege. And so if you will allow me to, I'm going to just take you, I'm just going to read a short passage. It takes you back to my sort of home and um, introduce you to um, a day of me driving through this place called Dearborn, Michigan. 
So this is a sweltering July afternoon. I absently drove through a neighborhood known as the heart of Arab Detroit. The quiet suburb of Dearborn, Michigan is famously home to the headquarters of the Ford Motor Company and also home to at least 30,000 Arab Americans. This is the Middle East in the Midwest, as Dearborn is often dubbed. It's a regular stop for journalists and TV crews who are looking for a Muslim man on the street, a uh, soundbite or exotic B-roll footage, everything from street signs along Michigan Avenue in Arabic, halal McNuggets at McDonald's, and even burqa-clad women rollerblading. These are all things you can see, um, uh, different images of Dearborn. So that's why on that day, driving along in 2007, I barely took notice of the cameraman setting up on the street corner. But then I came upon a swarm of police cars blocking off the street for at least a mile. Anxiously, I craned my neck to see what the gathering onlookers were fixed on. I could hear muffled cries in Arabic and a growing crowd of teenagers waving Iraqi flags further down Warren Avenue. Hoopties with boys piled on the roofs and Arabic radio stations blaring were slowly circling the police lines. Iraqi flags and outstretched arms hanging out the windows. In the distance, drums pounded. A little boy darted between the squad cars, waving his Iraqi flag and ignoring the reprimands of the police. I scanned through the car radio stations for news coverage of the war in Iraq. A white police officer directing traffic off of Warren Avenue waved me toward a side street. Leaning out my car window, I asked him, did something happen? He studied the amorphous mob of Arab teenagers in the distance. A lot of things are happening right now, he muttered. The fear in his eyes made my thoughts race. A few months earlier, I'd actually consulted on a major survey of Muslims in the US for the Pew Foundation. And the report had just been released and it caused a bit of a media stir. Um, despite the overall rosy findings of the report, it was reassuringly titled, American Muslims, Middle Class, and Mostly Mainstream. Um, Fox News and other conservative media were focused on the findings um, highlighting the political disaffection and frustration of American Muslim youth. And so anti-Muslim uh, anti right-wing bloggers and pundits were making alarmist arguments in the media about how the report proved that neighborhoods like what they called Dearbornistan constituted a homegrown threat. So this is what was on my mind as I turned onto the residential street corner. Seconds after I rounded the corner, Loud gunshots fired. My heart sank as I imagined the headlines, the photographs. Muslim youth, born and bred in America, holding demonstrations, uh, holding violent demonstrations. I spotted a middle-aged woman with a hot pink scarf tied over her hair, bouncing a toddler in her lap in the shade of her front porch. Shusar, I asked her from my car window. Iraq won the Asia Cup, she yelled back, smiling broadly, and then she lifted her hand in the air and pretended to shoot an imaginary celebratory bullet. So, um, oops. Uh, what I want to tell you is that, you know, places like Dearborn, Michigan get a lot of scrutiny, get a lot of attention. Since 9-11, millions of dollars are being poured into surveys on American Muslims. Uh, people, you know, whether it's the police, whether it's the, the State Department, whether it's um, academics like myself, uh, there's a lot of interest in American Muslims and what they think, their, their loyalties, their religious views, how attached they are to places in the Muslim world. Uh, and, and yet, for all of that money and energy and attention, American Muslims are often not really understood. And so, one way of thinking about all those surveys is that they are like a picture taken far away, um, where the details are kind of blurry, where uh, you know what's a celebration can also look like a riot, right? And so what I try to do in the book is to give you a kind of more intimate um, picture of places like Dear War, Michigan, and um, communities uh, of Muslims that are that are religious. Um, and that are, uh, you know, kind of the, considered the problem of the American Muslim community. So, you know, as I said in the passage that I read for, from, from, you know, the, the concern is really often about American Muslim youth, because unlike new immigrants, um, it's, it's actually the young people who were often born and bred in the U.S. that are most politically frustrated, that are most angry about surveillance and racial profiling, and are often more religious than their parents. And so this book is really about their stories. Um, you know, what does it mean? What does Islam mean to them? What does American citizenship mean to them? Um, and, uh, and, you know, often, 
just the uh, just the attachment to places outside of the U.S. is treated as though it's a problem. And so what I do in, in the book is to follow these American Muslim youth to places in what we call the Muslim world, right? And you know, part of what I try to do in the book is to kind of destabilize this idea, like what, where in the world is the Muslim world, first of all? You know, what do we mean by the Muslim world? Do Muslims live in a world of their own? Um, you know, uh, is, is the Muslim world another word for the Middle East, another a synonym for the Middle East? Of course, as you can see from the CIA's numbers, they're counting, you can trust them. Um, <laughs> right? uh, th 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 there is actually, most Muslims in the world do not live in the Middle East. So, you know, does the Muslim world just mean like the place where Muslims live? Well, you know, check out India or China. You got millions of Muslims there. Does it make any sense to talk about China as part of the Muslim world? Um, does Dearborn make America part of the Muslim world? That's, that's a Twitter storm waiting to happen. Um, so, in any case, so this is part of what I try to challenge um, in terms of just like what, what's become a kind of normal way of thinking about these things for us. And so now I want to take you from Dearborn to Cairo. Um, <clears throat> now Cairo was sort of unofficially deemed by President Obama in 2009 the capital of the Muslim world. Why? Because he decided to deliver what was called his Muslim world address from Cairo, Egypt. There was like all of this controversy, where is it gonna be? You know, that was part of the drama leading up to the, to the speech. It was like a surprise destination. And so um, the Muslim world here sort of figures as both a place that Obama went to and also this audience of like a billion people that he was addressing. I think that's interesting. Um, but what I wanna highlight with this quote here, which you can read, is that, uh, is the specific um, role or his usage of American Muslims. Now, the purpose of the speech was basically to show that his policies were going to be radically different from President uh, George W. Bush's, that we were no longer at war with Islam. In fact, the policies between George W. Bush and um, Obama, President Obama are actually quite similar vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Muslims abroad and also actually American Muslims too. But at least at this moment, this was sort of seen as a big break, and that's what the speech was trying to do. And if you see um, what he, the quote here, what he's basically arguing is that um, American Muslims have this wonderful history of you know, great accomplishments and achievements here in America. And so they're both models of how to be good citizens for Muslims in the Muslim world. And they're also a kind of evidence, proof, that America treats its minorities well. And so you've got you know, references to, oh, the Muslim that built the Sears Tower in Chicago and Muhammad Ali you know, lit the torch for the Olympics. And, you know, this congressman was sworn in on the Quran, um, uh, you know, which belonged to Thomas Jefferson. Now, there's no mention, of course, that all of these things were controversial at the time um, that they happened. But that's the kind of uh, message, message, that was a sort of purpose that American Muslims um, fulfilled for Obama. Now, contrary to this representation of them, we know that, in general, Muslims are treated um, uh, oh, this is the word also you can kind of see like what the main themes of the speech were. Um, this is what I was looking for before. And these, are, these are some of these, um, you know, concerning surveys and the kinds of results and the anxiety around American Muslim youth. Uh, and so what we, what we know is that, you know, American Muslims are generally treated as a, as a population that's potentially a threat, right? That, uh, you know, all of this energy that's spent around figuring out what American Muslims' politics are and whether or not they're happy. A lot of these are happiness, these surveys have like a happiness study built into them. You know, it's very, people are very worried about how happy Muslims are. And there's always a stress that like, American Muslims are much happier than Muslims in Europe. This is kind of like reassuring finding. But then these like Muslim, radical Muslim youth keep screwing things up, as you can see. Um, and so, you know, the story of how happy American Muslims are is a complicated one, depending on who you are. Uh, <clears throat> in any case, um, so as I was sort of following, I, I was really interested in this, in this demographic, this young 20-something politically radical, not radicalized, radical uh, American Muslim youth. And I followed them um, to the Middle East and uh, doing what, frightens a lot of people studying in madrasas. Now by madrasa, I do not mean um, jihad factory, okay? Which I know what some people think a madrasa is. By madrasa, I simply, which means simply school. Um, this is sort of like underground Islamic schools. So this is exactly the kind of thing that makes people very nervous. Now I interviewed hundreds of American Muslim um, young adults in the Middle East uh, over several years. 
And none of them were jihadists. So I can talk later about why none of them were jihadists. I'm not saying there are no Muslim jihadists in the world. There, of course, are. But I, there's a reason why I didn't encounter any, and I can talk about that later. Um, but what I did find is that uh, you know, they were, they were very, it was a very diverse spectrum of people, but what was interesting to me was that they were all asking the same questions. And those were questions about whether Islam needs to be reformed and how to reform it, and also questions about American citizenship and is there a place for us and is there a place for Islam in America. Um, and so uh, really what I've been trying to do with the book and what I hope to do today is to sort of show you that the way that Muslims themselves are debating about these things is very different from the picture of those debates that you usually get when you look at the media or even when you read um, books. Uh, because, in fact, the representations of American Muslims are all around us, right? You've got all these law and order episodes and other kinds of things. It's always sort of a shadowy American Muslim character. We're kind of surrounded by images of American Muslims, and yet they still are this, like, unknowable population in a certain kind of way. Um, and so since, uh, because of this sort of scrutiny, since September 11th, American Muslim leaders have gotten a lot of media attention. Um, and so what you have is, you know, regularly uh, articles, TV shows, programs, documentaries, uh, you know, talking to American Muslim religious leaders about who American Muslims are, what they really believe, and whether or not they're a threat, and, and also whether or not Islam can be reformed and rehabilitated. So one of these people is a liberal imam that became very famous. He worked for the State Department. Um, he was, he's, known, he's known as a sort of uh, ecumenical, very patriotic man. His book, uh, oh, you can't see the bottom of it, got cut off, sorry. It's What's Right with Islam is What's Right with America, right? So he's, his argument is America and Islam, perfectly compatible, there's no gap, right? And this is what he, he sort of built a reputation on for 10 years. Um, then, as he was renovating the building in which his community has been praying for decades, the Ground Zero Mosque incident happened. And that's, um, that's the imam that was at the head of it. And suddenly, this guy who was the poster child for liberal Islam and the reform of Islam and, a, and patriotic Islam became the guy that was building supposedly a Trojan horse mosque, a victory mosque for Al-Qaeda. And so it was really a moment where, for American Muslims, they had a pause, because this guy represented definitely the, the, the more liberal end of the spectrum, and even he could be accused of being a terrorist. And this sparked, of course, not just, this was not just a problem in New York. Mosques across the country started suddenly getting all of these grassroots, um, you know, anti, well, like picketers and people working to shut down mosques or shut down Islamic schools. In my own um, city where I live in, near New Haven, about 20 minutes from us, you know, people were showing up at the at services with pit bulls and other things. So this became like a national problem. It was really a crisis moment where American Muslims realized how tenuous that designation of good Muslim citizen, in fact, is. Um, and the other thing that I want to stress today is that in the process of making Muslim debates, translating Muslim debates, these, these journalists, and I'm only going to talk about what I'm calling sympathetic journalists, so people that are trying to present uh, Muslims in a sympathetic light. I'm not going to touch the Fox News and sort of conservative, um, you know, right-wing bloggers that we don't need to even go there. Uh, but I just want to talk about the people who are trying to do a sort of sympathetic job. And my argument is going to be that oftentimes, um, because they're tr trying to translate these Muslim debates for American audiences that have such little context for them, uh, there's just a total disconnect between the media representations of the conversation about reforming Islam and the actual conversation among Muslims happening on the ground in mosques uh, about reforming Islam. And so I'm going to give you a couple different cases of that um, today. And so what you see again and again, and this is what's striking to me, and this is so part of what I'm arguing is the labels of conservative and liberal completely fall away as irrelevant. You can't really describe these Muslim leaders as conservative Muslims and, and liberal Muslims, although the journalists continuously do that. And so I'm going to show you how really anybody can turn into a liberal Muslim or a good Muslim citizen, uh, depending on how the light is catching them in a certain moment, and also the reverse can happen. And, and so, um, but what, what I'm really struck by, more than what even the journalists are doing, 
is the ways in which this media attention itself really constrains these debates, makes, it, makes what's even possible for Muslims to say very small, right? Um, and so what's amazing to me is that like a whole slew of American Muslim leaders, no matter where they fall on the spectrum of various you know, debates, they're all essentially doing the same thing. Say, uh, saying that Islam has, has, some, has a big crisis, um, identifying what Islam's pathologies are, and then identifying, accepting uh, that Muslims are collectively responsible for terrorism in the first place, which itself I think is a question, not an answer. But you know, that's a, basically that's become like an unquestioned premise on which all of these American Muslim leaders begin, which is yes, as American Muslims, we're responsible for fixing terrorism, um, and we're collectively responsible. They also personally accept responsibility uh, as individuals, and then they say, hey, I've got the solution for terrorism. It's this reform project I've been working on for the last 20 years, okay? Uh, and every single one of them does this. And so I'm gonna show you a couple different cases if we see that. And so, uh, you know, part of what I'm arguing is that I'm not really interested in the reform projects themselves. I mean, and I, you know, I'm not trying to uh, criticize or, or, or undermine the sincerity of these various Muslim leaders who actually I, I all know personally and they're all very nice and sincere, and I hope they still like me after they read my book. We'll see. Um, but you know, it's, it's not it's not a personal attack on them in any way. Um, and Bilal knows what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, but no, what I'm trying to show is that you know whether they mean to or not, the, the options of what they can say is so narrow and that they're actually reproducing the good Muslim, bad Muslim you know, little Beirut versus Dearbornistan paradigm that I would like to see them resist. Uh, and, and so what I would argue is that these sympathetic articles and stories and the films are actually teaching us how to recognize good Muslim citizens, but also how to recognize bad Muslims. And as you'll see, the bad Muslims always look and sound the same. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, we often think of like assimilation as the erasing of difference over time. Um, you know, basically like, you know, you're kind of, you have cultural or religious differences and like over time they go away, right? That's what we normally think of as a story of assimilation. Well, what I'm trying to argue today is that no, assimilation is also always about making difference. It's about some Muslims making themselves different from other Muslims, like the Muslims that can be assimilated that's us, and the Muslims that can't be assimilated, can't be real citizens, can't be social citizens, that's them, right? And so we're gonna see this again and again. So the first one, so there's a debate about um, Islamic education and reform. So usually this is presented in the media as what? It's either a curriculum problem or a thinking problem, i.e. unlike Christianity and Judaism, the story goes, Islam has not sort of reconcile itself to a kind of critical tradition. There's no critical voices within Islam. That's one uh, premise. The other one is that Muslims read things to, read their books too literally, right? So, the, so these are the ways in which the reform of education is premised. Is that like, this is, this is the problem. Is it's, a, it's a thinking problem, it's a curriculum problem, it needs to be fixed. And that creates terrorism. So that's completely off. Uh, okay, there's, there's, there, it's not, there is a critical tradition within Islam. Um, there is also a fierce debate about educational reform that's been going on for two centuries in Islam. You know, since, I mean, since modernity, just like in Judaism and Christianity, there's a modern you know, reconception of what Islamic knowledge even is. Um, but the real core of that debate is about something that makes, doesn't make a lot of sense to people who don't know a lot about Islam, which is about form and content. In other words, can you just learn Islamic knowledge or does it matter the way you learn it? And so this man, Hamza Yusuf, a white convert from surfer, you know, turned sheikh from California, Northern California, um, has been making this argument for uh, his entire career as a Muslim preacher in the US that how you learn Islam is just as important as what you're learning. You can't divorce the content from the form. And so that's been his project uh, all of his adult life, long before 9-11. In addition to that, he's uh, known as a kind of fierce political uh, critic of the United States government, both its domestic and foreign policies. Um, you know, he's uh, an environmentalist. He's very invested in issues of race and prejudice. Um, and so, you know, he, he, uh, 
it, I wouldn't call him a liberal, but there's many ways in which his politics would be identified as liberal. Um, uh, but as you'll see, that becomes problematic. Now, after 9-11, he got an enormous amount of media attention. In fact, I'd say probably more than any other American Muslim leader. He didn't look like that anymore. He took the turban off, put a nice suit on. Um, and uh, when he got this media attention, what you saw was, again, these are sympathetic journalists that are saying, okay, he's very funny, which he is, very charismatic, which he is. Um, they would highlight that he's good looking. Some, someone said he could be a beetle, right? I don't know, you can judge for yourself. Could you imagine him as a fifth beetle? Um, and, uh, and, and that he was this great potential reformer. In fact, one journalist said he's the most able theological critic in the Muslim world. Right, of suicide bombing. Um, and so what, what are the reasons for this? Well, you know, he was one of the first people that said Islam was on that plane as a victim on 9-11, right? This is not true Islam. Um, the terrorists are the enemies of Islam. The 9-11 terrorists, they're, they're mass murderers. And then the NY, uh, the New York firefighters who saved lives on 9-11, they're martyrs uh, in the Islamic tradition. And, and so he, he, you know, he uh, underwent a kind of transformation as he described it. He said that he also learned something on 9-11, that he had been with his, his very strong political critiques of America, American culture and American politics, that he had been complicit in producing what he called the culture of anger um, that characterized American Muslim communities and the discourse of anger. And so what you see here is exactly what I said before. There's the accepting of personal responsibility and collective responsibility. Um, and so one of the things that happened is he, his uh, answer was to this problem was that Muslims themselves needed to become self-critical and introspective, and this is a quote, to reject the discourse of anger, because there's a lot of anger in the Muslim world about their oppressive living conditions, and the desire to blame others leads to anger and eventually to wrath, neither of which are rungs on a spiritual ladder to God, end of quote. Um, and so there you see it. There's the victimization of Islam itself, diagnosis of collective guilt for um, all Muslims, the redirection of uh, criticism to Muslim communities, an individual acceptance and repentance for his complicity in producing this Muslim culture of anger, and his assurances uh, to the public and to the state, because he was advising George W. Bush, that Islam was a good religion and that it confirmed dominant Western Enlightenment values, that it could be rehabilitated. Well, how? Um, and so here, uh, here comes Yusuf's diagnosis uh, of the Muslim world, which is an intellectual ailment. So this is the quote that's up here, um, which you can take a look at. So he's diagnosing the Muslim world with, um, oh, so this is from the LA Times. So he's basically saying there's a, it's, there's a, there's a pedagogical problem, okay? Um, and if we just want to quickly look at that, he says, basically, Islam has very few um, scholars at the very high levels. Most of the brilliant students in the Middle East now go into medicine and engineering. We need medicine and engineering majors in here. Uh, they don't go into philosophy. Any philosophers in here? Uh, almost every one of these terrorists that are identified, you will not find amongst them anyone who did his degree in philosophy and literature and humanities and theology. I came out of the Enlightenment tradition, and I still believe in the best of the Enlightenment tradition. I think Islam confirms and enhances that tradition. So you see a kind of echo of that other book title, right? What's right with America is what's right with Islam, that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> so if you're reading this quote in the LA Times, this doesn't sound all that strange. It actually probably make you think, oh, okay, so this man supports the US government's billions of dollars that have been spent since 9-11 in madrasas in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Okay, what you wouldn't pick up on, which anyone who knows Hamza Yusuf as in the Muslim community would understand, is that when he's talking about the humanities and the enlightenment tradition, he's not talking about what goes on in the English department at, at, at Williams College. He's talking about madrasas, not jihad factories, Islamic schools. He sees that traditional classical Islamic education as perfectly in line with the humanities, and his whole career is about building those madrasas here in the US. Um, but in this kind of an article, that huge difference between what he means just gets glossed over with the word humanities, right? Because he means something very different from what maybe some of your professors mean when they say humanities. Okay, so that's one example. Oops, did I lose somebody here? Okay. Um, let's move from the Sufis to Sufi intellectuals to the feminists. Uh, okay, so. Um, a lot of progressive Muslims, as they called themselves, or feminist Muslims, also received a lot of media coverage after 9-11. Uh, and there was one group called the Progressive Muslim Union, 
quickly became media darlings. So they're like in the Financial Times, Newsweek, Time Magazine, New York Times, and they're also on all of these shows. Now, in contrast to the angry rhetoric and the crisis of Islamic learning that Yusuf says is the problem, right? They, the PMU spokespeople um, are reinscribing the collective guilt of Muslims through the critique of social conservatism and um, sexism. Uh, in mosques and Islamic institutions. So in one article, one of the progressive Muslim leaders basically said that in American mosques, the discourse was restricted to what he described as the hyper-conservative, the very conservative, and the moderately conservative. So the PMU is the alternative discursive space for what he called the silent liberal majority of Muslims. So basically they're saying, we are the liberal Muslims and we're gonna fix this problem. Um, and so you'd have their uh, unofficial uh, website, which was, you know, uh, called Muslim Wake Up, which has featured all these articles and cartoons about sexist immigrant fobs, people that are fresh off the boat, um, you know, sexist immigrant men, basically. Uh, and so these, the media appearances that were made by these progressive Muslim feminists were invariably always second generation, Middle Eastern and South Asian um, Americans. So they had accentless English, trendy clothes, up to the minute hairstyles. All of this is telling you what, that they, they smell like expensive cologne, not spicy food. They, if they pray, they pray calmly, right? This is, this is sort of the messaging, the optics of all of this. Now, despite these promising trappings, um, again and again, they get, keep getting hit with the same questions. So, for example, when they were on, Bill Maher used to have a show called Politically Incorrect. You're all probably too young to remember that. Maybe a couple of you remember that. Um, and in one instance, when they were on, there was two progressive Muslim feminists on the show, and Bill Maher asks, are you Muslim first or American first? So before we even get into what the answer is, I wanna to highlight to you that what's important is that by asking that question, he's both um, underlining that they're Muslim and that they're disavowing something about Islam, right? So in other words, um, the, the, the way it works is that they have to, they can't just be, more, they can't just be identified as feminists or as Americans. It's always as Muslim American feminists and that then there's a disavowal of the Muslim world, their parents' culture, Amer Muslim sexism. And so that's the kind of way in which the transcendence of American citizenship, the success story of assimilation is dramatized for us. Um, and so, you know, this idea that, 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 that they would be models of liberal citizenship for Muslims in the Muslim world. Now, if there was one sort of media um, high in all of this coverage of the progressive Muslims, it was over what, uh, called, what was called the female or the women-led prayer initiative in 2005. Um, so basically you had this woman, Amina Wadud, the African-American woman um, there with the veil. Um, who was a you know, long-standing preacher in American mosque communities, a feminist, uh, and she led men and women in this uh, prayer event, which is unusual. Usually, uh, if there's a mixed congregation of men and women, the imam, the prayer leader, is a man. Uh, and if it's only women, sometimes you'll have a female imam. But to have men and women praying together behind a woman is, was, is very uh, unusual, radical, uh, atypical. Um, and so, um, it was organized by Asra Namani, this is a journalist here, uh, an Indian American journalist, there on the bottom. And it was also a way for her to kick off her book tour. Um, and so, we'll hear more about that. And so, you know, the event got all kinds of attention. These were brave pioneers, they were going to, you know, um, bring uh, gender equality to Islam. And, uh, you know, the, the, w although the, the money shot or sort of like the, 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 the optic that everybody wanted was this image of Wadud there praying in front of men and women, the story in most of the media coverage was about Nomani. And so journalists would call Nomani Islam's Rosa Parks, the Muslim Sojourner Truth, Islam's Martin Luther and or Martin Luther King Jr., right? And Nomani herself often compared herself to Rosa Parks and Martin Luther. So she named the bus for her book tour the uh, Muslim Woman's Freedom Bus, right, for example. So in addition to these historical analogies that are being made about and by Nomani, um, she's explicitly tying this event to 9-11. So there's a quote here, and this is up on the... Um, uh, slide as well. So today will be remembered as the day when about 130 Muslim w w women and men stood shoulder to shoulder behind a woman on Manhattan's Upper West Side and took their faith back from the extremists who tried to define Islam on 9-11. I was proud to be in the front row. New York City has been a beacon to the world for its courage after 9-11. Our prayer makes New York a city of light to the Muslim world. Now, how was this event received in, in American mosques? Um, first of all, there have been decades of 
debates about gender equality in American mosques. But most American Muslim women have not been fighting for the right to be the imam. That has not been what most American Muslim, have been de Muslim women have been demanding. What they've been asking for is uh, other kinds of leadership roles, um, you know, better accommodations in the mosque, a whole host of other things. None of that was part of the media coverage, and there was a lot of media coverage of this event. It was like basically the Catholic story about women wanting to be female priests. You know, the, that that idea was basically just superimposed as like this must be the same narrative, same story happening in Islam, except that priests and imams aren't the same thing. In other words, the highest ranking status of religious authority is, is not a, 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 an imam. It's actually a scholar, which women uh, were. Is that my, I'm afraid that's my phone. Sorry. I'm interrupting my own talk. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so basically, you know, what, 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 in other words, there's like this false equivalence happening. The other, between Catholic, the Catholic debate just becomes the Muslim debate. So for a lot of American Muslims, they're very frustrated by that false equivalence. The other thing is that for most Americans, when they see women praying behind men, they, they're thinking of what? What's the reference? This is a real question like a Jim Crow bus, back of the bus, right? So there's kind of like a back of the bus reading imposed on mosque space that if, you're, if the women are behind the men, then uh, women must be like uh, symbolically, you know, less valuable, or et cetera, et cetera. So the problem for American Muslims was that first of all, they were saying, well, a mosque space, prayer space is not like a church. There's not like an altar in the front so that the closer you are to the altar, then the closer you are to God, basically. The, the, the idea of intimacy with the divine is when your forehead hits the ground. So it doesn't really matter where you're standing in the space. This was the argument. And the second thing was um, that, uh, that also that, that the spatiality is not related to the value. You know, in other words, that we think of a, of, a, of a Jim Crow bus, it's like, okay, being in the back means you're worse, and it's the same thing. This is not how we imagine space in our own ritual. So there's these, these, these things are being translated to American context that don't fit for most people. Now, of course, for Wadud, she's saying, no, it is like a Jim Crow era bus, and that's why I want it to be different. I do want to be the imam. Um, <clears throat> OK, but my point is simply that, that, the, that the, the major debates that are actually happening in US mosques weren't even part of the conversation. So for a lot of American audiences experiencing the debate, you know, whether you were on Wadud's side or not became the litmus test of whether you were like a fundamentalist slash terrorist. And then once Wadud started getting a couple, um, you know, threatening phone calls and death threats, then it became crystal clear. Like the people who are against Wadud are the people that are like with Al Qaeda, right? And so the, ho the whole uh, story became completely a distortion of what's actually happening in American mosques. Um, now, Nomani. Uh, made this argument very explicit, that terrorism and sexism are kind of the same thing, and what she called a slippery slope argument in several of these newspaper articles. So she said, Muslim Americans are collectively responsible for terrorism, and she argues, especially sexist immigrant Muslim men, because their sexism creates a slippery slope which leads to terrorism. And so she claims that her feminist project is not just making mosques more gender equitable, it's actually a very effective counterterrorism tool. And so, for example, she had an article um, titled Profile Me, uh, which was in support of racial profiling in airports against Muslims. Now, so this is where I'm saying it's kind of hard to call her a liberal when she's you know, pro-war, pro-racial profiling, having, you know, her feminism may in fact be liberal, but there's all kinds of other policies that she supports that are kind of conservative. So liberal Muslims suddenly don't always look so liberal. In fact, the Progressive Muslim Union fell apart over questions like Israel-Palestine, the Iraq War, Afghanistan, drones, all these things were things that these liberal Muslims could not all agree on. Um, so there you have it. OK. So I think I s skipped over this one. Um, <clears throat> wait, OK on time? Hmm. OK, <clears throat> all right, just two more quick cases. So like feminists, African-American Muslims, and like Sufi intellectuals, African-American Muslims are also sometimes offered as the good Muslim citizen as, a, you know, as opposed to immigrant Muslims, right? Um, now, in, I have to say in most media coverage of American Muslims, African-American Muslims are usually just like left off, right? Because the logic of what an American Muslim even is is already a foreign population. So American, American, African American Muslims mess that up. They don't, they don't look Muslim or they don't seem Muslim. In the, they're not what we, people expect to see as a Muslim. And so 
let's say like in the majority of the time they're not even part of the conversation. So for example, the Ground Zero Mosque controversy, which was the biggest story uh, about Islam in 2010 in US media, I couldn't find a single newspaper article that quoted any African American Muslims. So that's just to give you a kind of index. This isn't just like my sense. I actually have evidence uh, that that's true. But in those cases when African, there is a story about African American Muslims, it's often about their tension with immigrant Muslim communities. So this is an image from the New York, a New York Times article that talks about these tensions which are class, racial, uh, different histories, not being able to understand each other, whatever other kinds of tensions that have come up over time um, between black Muslim communities and certain immigrant communities. And so you've got uh, Imam Talib, which is an African American Muslim uh, Imam from New York, hanging out here and having a conversation with a Kashmiri uh, doctor from Long Island. So what are you to take from the image, right? Which is that immigrant Muslims live in the burbs and African-American Muslims live in the city. Except I lived in New York for eight years and actually most immigrant Muslims are not Kashmiri doctors living in Long Island. Most immigrant Muslims in New York are actually poor and working class and live in the city. Uh, and so there's a much more complicated picture It's not the, the, than, the, than the one in which the media that you get over and over in the media of privileged, slash racist immigrants and underprivileged African Americans. It's actually far more complicated than that. Um, and then another instance, this is one of my favorites, uh, you know, um, um, African American Muslims are often labeled indigenous Muslims, and sometimes so are white converts too, indigenous Muslims. And so journalists uh, make this argument that unlike in Europe, in America, and even also in, unlike Canada, right, or Australia, in, in the US is unique because it has this huge convert population. No other Western uh, country has a Muslim population that's from, that's not immigrant, that's from its own people, right? And so these indigenous Muslims are naturally patriotic, naturally loving America, and also, um, you know, they're like more, they're, they're more gender equitable, they love music, you know, so in one article, a journalist comes into a black mosque and they're all listening to music, and then some immigrants get up and leave, right? Because they don't, they don't believe that music should be played in a mosque. And so one is left with the impression that, in fact, immigrants don't believe Muslim, uh, music is allowed in Islam, and African American Muslims do, which is like completely not true. If you've ever been in a cab with a Muslim cab driver, they listen to music, a lot of them. Uh, so, you know, this is the, this, this kind of stuff that, like, you know, African American Islam has this, like, and there are also, by the way, some African American Muslims who don't listen to music and think that it's sinful. So, you know, this, there's, it's actually far more complicated than the kind of picture you get. Okay, last case, and this is the scary one. Salafis, <clears throat> okay, no debate uh, in Islam receives more media coverage than the theological and legal one over the J word. Jihad, right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> all right, so um, this man's name is Yasser Qadi. He is uh, one of the leaders of a group called Al Maghrib Institute, which basically revived the American Salafi movement, which is a, um, you know, uh, what's often called a conservative Muslim community or movement. Um, <clears throat> now, Salafis have gotten hit hard after 9 11. Why? Because this guy in the corner, Olaki, uh, used to be, uh, uh, is, is, is identified with the Salafi uh, movement and um, as you may know, at one point was the highest ranking English speaking member of Al Qaeda. So he actually left the US and went um, to Yemen. Um, and so because of that association, there are some people within the American Salafi movement and the, even the Al-Maghrib students themselves who actually <coughs> sympathized with uh, Olaki would buy his tapes and read his writings and other things. And so, you know, for that reason, this, is a, this in particular is a Muslim movement in the U.S. that's received a lot of political scrutiny. So, you know, conservative bloggers consider Al-Maghrib like jihad, you, or this kind of stuff. But you may be surprised to find that the same, the journalists in the New York Times are going to make an argument that no, in fact, Yasser Qadi and his version of Islam would be, hey, just like those feminists, blacks, and Sufis, a great counterterrorism tool, and here's why. Um, so Qadi presents Salafi Islam as what he calls Orthodox Islam with a capital O, and he has carefully modeled and branded his view of Islam and his reform movement on Orthodox Jews. So he, you know, if we think Orthodox Judaism 
You might associate that with being conservative, with being old-fashioned, with being rigid. These are all things that Al-Qadi is happy to embrace. He's all over that. Uh, and, and, and so because he, he is, in his view, um, he represents the truest and purest version of Islam, um, this, of course, made other American Muslims unhappy because they said, well, wait a minute, we consider ourselves orthodox, including, for example, feminist Muslims like Wadud, who considers herself an orthodox Muslim. So orthodox, you know, what orthodox means to Muslims is not what the way it's used by most Americans. Um, and so it's the same thing with the back of the bus reading or you know, the other, other, other instances of these like false equivalences or mistranslations, right? Uh, so in the company of U.S. government counterterrorism officials and journalists, Gadi positions himself and al-Maghrib as a solution to extremists like Olaki precisely because he is a pacifist Salafi and an orthodox Muslim. And so this New York Times article, which is like a massive 11-page interactive thing, right, uh, is fascinating. See, Gadi is portrayed as an all-American geek, these are all quotes, a Star Trek fan, a graduate student at Yale University, I knew him. Um, the article lingers on how he dresses in polo shirts and drives a black Honda CRV, vacations at Disney World with his wife and kids, and how he's ordering a coffee at Starbucks or pulling into a Popeyes and getting gravy, gravy slathered biscuits, right? So what is it here? It's his consumption habits that are rendering his, this ultra conservative difference uh, assimilatable, right? We can, we can sort of assimilate him. So just as Yusuf was seen as this sort of the most able theological critic of suicide bombing, so is Gadi. Um, uh, now, Gadi himself says he can't talk about jihad because it would make the US government uncomfortable. And so he, he ha he's very constrained in what he can teach his students. Um, but that he also says that you know, he's, because he is an orthodox Muslim, he's the best one to kind of offset the radical discourse of Al Qaeda. So in one lecture that's featured on the link for the New York Times, Gadi gestures at a lush hotel auditorium adorned with crystal chandeliers when he's speaking and he asks his students this question. Should you follow a guy in, <coughs> I'm sorry, should you follow a guy in a cave or a guy lecturing in a beautiful hall? Okay, in other words, in the logic of this good Muslim citizens uh, that, uh, versus bad Muslims that Gadi identifies, he's reproducing the, the, his mainstream consumption habits, his um, success as a savvy businessman, and his material wealth that makes him different from this robed, turbaned, bad, backwards Salafi who lives in a cave, supposedly, and fails to indigenize, right, the way Sal the Salafis have, as, as they claim. Now, in reality, okay, Olaki is not, did not draw al Maghrib students um, like the Christmas Day bomber who was an al Maghrib student away from someone like Gadi because of his clothes or because of his cave, right? It's what? It's because of Al-Qaeda's radical politics and its promise for global social justice. So, um, <clears throat> while American Muslim leaders like Gadi and others have taken it as their personal responsibility to combat extremism, they've largely failed to address the political grievances of disaffected Muslim youth, the global Muslim suffering in which the U.S. is implicated that they find when they read the newspaper or watch the news. The problem is not how they read the Quran, although that's what Gadi says it is, and he says that this is, I, I can teach them how to read it the right way, right? In other words, by constructing um, the problem as religious rather than political, all of these reform projects suddenly become very important, things that, that the US government should invest in. But in fact, they are primarily political and not religious. Um, and I think that that's very clear when you actually look at what these young people are saying. So journalists construct figures like Gadi as solutions, as teachers who can indoctrinize a disaffected Muslim youth to read Islamic theology and law the right way. Mm. Now, what the article also mentions is that when Gadi brings the FBI agent, he springs this on his students at Al Maghrib, uh, you know, they're, they're a bit surprised. And some students are taken aback that their teacher is basically openly endorsing self policing and even racial profiling of Muslim youth. And uh, just like some critics started calling Hamza Yusuf Hamza useless, some former Al Maghrib students started calling Yasser Qadi, Yes Sir Qadi, right? So there's a way in which, when these Muslim leaders are doing this delicate dance between the State Department and with their uh, constituents, their own religious authority is also very much, very fragile in that. <clears throat> 
Now, what I hope you take from this is that over the course of the, of the last uh, decade and more, since 9-11, American journalists have offered various American Muslims as solutions to Islam's crises. Ultra-conservative but pacifist fundamentalists, blacks, feminists, Sufi intellectuals. The fear about the ways Islam might be perceived finds its ways into the ways Muslims argue with one, one another, even when the cameras are gone, the visitors are, are not in the mosque, Muslims, the way Muslims talk to each other about these issues has been dramatically transformed, and I think in a bad way. In other words, the ways these debates are no longer healthy, they're very constrained. Um, everyone's always hyper-conscious of the way they can even talk to each other, so there isn't really an honest conversation that's happening. American Muslim spokespeople reframe the attention and curiosity garnered by 9-11 in service of their own reform projects. It's not, shouldn't be too much of a surprise. So whether we're talking about Yusuf's pedagogical reform, what due to Nomani, Nomani's, what they call the gender jihad, um, certain African American Muslim leaders, what they call the indigeniz indigenization of Islam, or Gadi's indoctrinizing of Muslim Americans um, into orthodoxy with a capital O, right? Each of these is calibrated as a way to make American Muslims recognizable as social citizens who could stand for the nation. These are not merely oversimplified media representations. They actually index the ways, the, the, the very process of making debates about Islam digestible to American audiences. American Muslims are translating Muslim differences in terms of these very narrow set of terms of good Muslims and bad Muslims. Um, so good Muslim citizens are contrasted against presumably anti-intellectual, sexist, racist, fundamentalist, backwards, bad Muslim immigrants, brown, male, probably an engineering major. Um, and they reinscribe the exclusion of some Muslims from American social citizenship. This is what I'm really concerned about. No one is questioning whether it's right for Muslims as a population to be held collectively responsible for the actions of a fringe of 19 terrorists, right? And so that's now become a radical position and radical has now become a slur in American mosques. And that's what I want to undo today. And I hope I've persuaded you. <laughs> Thank you. Great talk. Thank you so much for that talk. I think it raises a lot of really important questions. And so I'm going to ask a question just to get us started. And then I'll just kind of moderate people and just raise your hand if you have a question. And we'll start having a discussion. Um, so I have a question for you that's probably impossible to answer. But what do you think is the solution in terms of, so this is something I encounter all the time, too, as someone who does kind of the completely opposite as far as you can get away from that particular topic in my area of specialty is the first three centuries of Islamic history. So kind of the whole opposite spectrum, but still I always am running into very same problems of us versus them, or even people you know, invoking the kind of great middle ages of when Islamic history held the reins of you know, culture in its hands as, you know, well that was when they were good and now is when they were bad. And so it always becomes this binary, good, bad. Um, and uh, you know, I think that part of my role as an educator, or our role as educators, is in the classroom to try to break down some of these binaries. But how in the media, when it's so easy to, uh, in your book, you you show this picture of uh, Wadud, and say that well, people wanted to come take her picture, but they didn't even listen to her sermon that she gave afterwards. They didn't care about the content. They just wanted that sound that bite. Cigarette break, yeah. Well, she's giving the sermon. Let's go out and smoke instead of actually listening to what this person has to say. So. Does the media inherently lend itself to these sound bites, to these binaries? And if so, how, how are we going to get people to listen to the actual debates that are happening in Muslim communities? Thanks. Again, it might be impossible. It's not an impossible question, but it is, it is, it is a difficult question. I mean, I, I have to confess that, you know, I, first of all, I, I, I feel like uh, we have to be part of the public conversation and the national conversation and actually global conversation. Um, as intellectuals, as scholars, as students, as just people that are trying to think. Um, and so I do think that you can chip away at those narratives. And that's what I, what, I mean, my, as I said, this, this is not really a critique of the people I talked about so much as an urging and to sort of show them that, hey, do you know that you sound exactly like all these other Muslim leaders who you probably don't really even really like, uh, but you're all doing the same thing? Like, y'all actually sound the same on the radio. 
And that's what I really want to point out to them. Um, and so I do think that there's a way to say, well, you know, um, actually, we're not all collectively responsible for terrorism because we're not all terrorists, actually. Um, so, you know, we're, we're I mean, we, we can't take responsibility for for this. That doesn't mean that there isn't a conversation about reform, but I think the way things get translated matters. And so I think that it's very easy and very natural for someone to say, oh, well, you're worried about the reform of Islam. Actually, I've got something to say about that that I've been working on for 20 years. Um, and I think it's part of it is learning to resist that and recognizing the limitations of what the media forum, forum allows us. So I mean, I'll give you an example. When there was all of this talk about whether Obama was Muslim, and I was on NPR, um, and so it came up, and so I said, oh, well, you know, people think Obama's Muslim, but people thought FDR was a Jew, people thought Lincoln was a Catholic. You know, in moments of national crisis, Americans project their anxieties about religious minorities on the identity of their president, okay? So that, that's like a reasonable answer, but that's not actually what I think. Um, I, I <laughs> but that's what you say at NPR, because you've got like a minute. Right, so I think that that's a somewhat nuanced answer, but it's, I actually think that the racial politics and xenophobia of you know Lincoln's era and FDR's era is radically different from Obama's era, and that there, that's something that we need to account for. But maybe the space for that is not an NPR like two minutes you know window. Maybe that's an op-ed. Maybe that's something else. You know, so I think it's about using using the media as well as you can and recognizing. When you're on NPR or you're on any kind of radio or TV show, you don't have the time to get into a long-winded thing. And so maybe you'll say something simpler, but it, says, it, it complicates it a little bit, you know. And then find other places to say something in a jargon-free way that, you know, so we have to kind of like, we have to think of the media as a tool um, and not as the enemy, which is certainly not what I'm trying to say. I mean, I don't think these journalists are, have bad intentions. I just think that the, 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 the big story about a good Islam and a bad Islam is so hegemonic, to use the technical term, or just such an overwhelming kind of frame that it's just everything automatically turns into that. I mean, to me, it's just so funny if you step back and think, what does gender equality in the mosque have to do with terrorism? To me, it doesn't really, I don't think those things are like naturally connected. I think you can be sexist and not a terrorist. Like I, I, mean, I don't know, is that possible? I think it is, you know? But like these things have become so like, automatically linked and we don't even question it, you know what I mean? Because um, I, I think I know a couple sexists who are not terrorists. I mean, I'm just saying, like, 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 like but we've just become so accustomed to, there's like, Islam has this, has this crisis, has this problem, and we gotta find it and, you know, crush it. And so, sexist immigrant men, that sounds right. Okay, go for it, you know. And I mean, frankly, everyone, it's always the same set of people that are getting thrown under the bus. You know, I don't have like a special spot in my heart for like brown immigrant engineering majors, I swear. You know, it's just that I think it's problematic that this particularly vulnerable um, population is getting thrown under the bus by everybody. And so that tells us something about not like these individual people, but about the racial climate in general. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, should I just stay up here then? Okay. Or or comment or just it doesn't have to be a question. Well, where is <laughs> what is it about is do you find any words about the Islam that makes everybody so determined on that? Well, yeah, I mean, I think, I think you're, you're absolutely hitting on something that's, that's, you're, you know, that's a really good insight, which is that the way Islam is explained is as a cultural force that overpowers the people that are part of it, that are touched by it. So if you think about it as like, you know, we have a culture, their culture has them. You see what I mean? It's just like a completely different way of thinking about, you know, um, I mean, so for example, like after 9-11, 
I don't know if you know this, but the Quran became a bestseller in America. Why? Because people are like, let me find the line that triggered this, where these automatons like came across this page and were like, oh, okay, going to the airport. You know, that's not how it happened. Like maybe the way to understand September 11th is not in this religious text from you know the seventh century, but from like a history text, because actually Osama bin Laden is what we call a cold warrior. I think the context of the Cold War is a lot more generative of insights about why 9-11 happened than like the kind of stuff that she works on and you know the first, first couple centuries of Islam. But there's a way in which, you know, the idea of what Islamic culture is is it's just that it's not like culture isn't always culture. That's what I would say. Mm-hmm. You said that some of the, the main thought leaders are in favor of racial profiling in airports and other places. Can you sort of summarize what their argument is? That, because many people obviously are against that. Yeah, I mean, isn't, isn't, this, isn't this problematic that, you know, the people who are representing the American Muslim community don't have the same politics as most probably American Muslims? I mean, I don't, I, I, I can't imagine that most American Muslims are for racial profiling. Um, I'm quite sure that's not the case. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you that for me, I have a, I have a Sikh last name. Uh, my family was Sikh before they converted to Islam about 200 years ago. So I, I pass. The TSA doesn't catch me in the net of, like, you know, Muslims getting on the plane. My kids happen to have an Arab last name, their Arab father, you know. Um, so when I'm traveling with my one-year-old, okay, and I promise you I have much more radical politics than my one-year-old, um, we always get stopped. And, um, you know, and, and, and because the TSA does recognize him, right, um, as, a, as a kind of, Threat. So I mean, we, we know that this racial profiling doesn't work. We, we, in fact, you know what's funny? And this is, this is a little, I'll take you back to Dearborn again. This is another little Dearborn story. So when, when George W. Bush came to Dearborn um, when he was running the first time, one of his uh, things that he was fighting for is he was telling Arab American communities, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do away with racial profiling of Arab communities. This is in 2000, not 2001. So then everything suddenly changed, right? But that was his... So that was his, uh, uh, one of his, run- his, his talking points. Because really, um, in the 90s, racial, being against racial profiling wasn't like a liberal thing. There was basically a national consensus on both the right and the left that racial profiling was unfair, un-American, ineffective, bad, basically. After 9-11, even on the left, you had a lot of people that suddenly were pro-racial profiling, including the minority communities that suffer from racial, racial profiling the most, African Americans and Latinos in New York, in very large numbers, said, yeah, we're okay with racial profiling now. Even though, frankly, they suffer it far more than Muslims do, even to this day, right? So, so that, you know, following the conversation on like, what racial profiling, like who, you know, why we think racial profiling is now fine, is itself, I think, a totally fascinating topic. I think the, the issue with these Muslim leaders is they're under so much pressure that, and they're so afraid of being labeled a radical Muslim that they just don't say even things that really aren't that radical, which is like, like something like racial profiling is a bad thing. You know, uh, It's funny, with Hamza Yusuf, when he was actually at the White House advising President uh, Bush, literally at the White House, the FBI came knocking at his door and saying, we found some of your sermons and we talked to his wife and they said, we need, we need to talk to him because we think he's a radical imam, radicalizing Muslim youth and we need to interview him. And she had to say, actually, he's at the White House. So check with your boss, you know. And, and so, you know, that's, that, that story actually helped to kind of rebuild Hamza Yusuf's image in the community because people sort of started saying, are you a sellout? Why are you working with the government? So, in fact, I mean, even though these people are all tied in certain ways to the, to the State Department or to the government because, they, because they're under so much surveillance, they, they're also constantly under the threat of becoming, you know, they, even if you're working with the government, as like the case of, of the Ra'uf that I mentioned at the very beginning, the Ground Zero Mosque, quote unquote, Ground Zero Mosque Imam. I mean, this guy literally was an employee of the State Department. He was doing tours for the US government, reforming Muslims in Malaysia and other parts of the Muslim world. The next thing you know, he's suddenly a Hezbollah agent. I mean, that, so it just, you know, these, the, the, everyone understands like our position as Muslim leaders is so fragile. And I think that's why they feel very constrained in what they can say. And so they, they espouse this, you know, very conservative politics. It's not representative. But yet, they're the people that always get the microphone. Right? So that's the problem. So I just want to see more radical Muslims out there. 
<laughs> Leave that off the tape. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, uh -huh. Did I hear somebody here? No. Okay. Other other questions, thoughts? I mean, I think that speech is such a fascinating document. We should all go home and Google it. I mean, it's really an interesting read. And, and honestly, it was very controversial because in 2009, you know, because Obama says a couple things like, hey, you know, we probably shouldn't have supported the, the, the Shah in Iran against the democratic revolution that was happening. Sorry about that. And then people went crazy. People said, well, how could you admit that the US government has made any kinds of policy errors with the Muslim world? Or, you know, because in 2009, the idea that the US supports dictators in, in Muslim societies was like, you know, kind of a surprise. You know, now that like, now I, I know this. You know, this seems kind of strange. Now that you know, we have I mean, Syria, Egypt. Like, it's like you know, he, he, Obama won't even call what happened in Egypt a coup. So, I mean, the Egypt that we're talking about in 2009 is not the Egypt of 2014. Um, and Obama's relationship to Egypt has also changed dramatically. But what, what I mean, what I have to say is that. I mean, my book is about American Muslims and their relationship to the Muslim world, and, and I think those are. Um, ties that are not gonna go away, although there's a lot of pressure to crush them, whether it's charitable ties, whether it's intellectual ties, I just think that, that it's a transnational global age and you're not gonna be able to break those. Um, but I am very concerned about the way the state uses American Muslims abroad. So just like in the Cold War, the US government marshaled all these um, African American jazz musicians to go around the world and sort of show that, oh, race relations in the US are fine. Look at these jazz musicians. They're, this is like the best of African American culture. Ignore those images of dogs, you know, biting black protesters and don't worry about Jim Crow. You know, that was sort of, it was, a, it was cultural diplomacy. And you see the exact same thing happening now. So the State Department is sponsoring all kinds of tours of American Muslim hip hop artists or uh, spoken word performers or, you know, art, like, it's, it's, it's the same story that American Muslims are going to prove to the Muslim world that America, the US government is not anti-Muslim, not anti-Islam. Don't take those drones so personally. You know, it's not about your religion or you. It's just, you know, do you know what I mean? That's sort of the thing. And I think that's very dangerous and very, um, that cultural diplomacy is a, is a big problem. And so if that's the relationship that we're talking about with American Muslims and the Muslim world, I think that's a, you know, that's not gonna be a productive relationship. Um, at all. In fact, it's interesting, in some of these instances, they'll, the American Muslim performers will go, um, like I think this happened in Indonesia, and somebody just rode his motorcycle right on the stage and started protesting. Or they'll send American Muslims to Palestine, like to you know, Gaza or something, as if that, you know, but then like US policy in Gaza, which is probably more relevant to Palestinians, is not like the issue. It's just like, oh look, we're sending American Muslims to learn about your problems in Palestine. You know, that's, a, that's the, this is the kind of stuff, it's like not actually productive. You're not taking the debate seriously, which is what I'm arguing. I care about terrorism too. I think that I teach classes on this stuff. I mean, I'm very invested in this issue, but I think unless we're ready to be honest about what actually the political disaffection of Muslims is about, we're not gonna go anywhere. It's actually, you know, not about what all these journalists are talking about or what the US government's like cultural diplomacy tours are about, which is like, can Muslims be into hip hop? Yes. You know, that's not, that's not the fix. Uh -huh. You mentioned these four case studies. These were not in academic settings. These were more uh, NGOs or, or freelance writers or businessmen. So I was wondering, was the discussion in uh, American academic settings, would you see a similar kind of phenomenon happening there? So what was happening on college campuses at the same time? Um, so you're, let me just make sure I understand your question. So you're asking me that as these um, religious leaders and other people are, are being interviewed in the media, you're saying what's happening in college campuses? Yes, it's discussion that you were describing if you saw a sort of mirror on college campuses. Um, okay, so there's, so there's different elements within college campuses, but I would say that the Muslim Student Associations, which is a kind of national uh, 
religious uh, student organization that you see at many campuses, right? That discourse was often mirrored by these people because a lot of these figures that I talked about are really important public intellectuals for religious Muslims. And by the way, you know, they're, not all Muslims are even religious or even care. There's a lot of Muslims who wouldn't even know who these people are. But when you're talking about devoutly religious Muslims, they're all going to know who these people are. And for many of them, they're very invested in what they have to say. And so, you know, to the earlier question about why the conservative politics, what's been troubling to me is to see, like, 19-year-olds that are, have this incredibly concern. I mean, if you can't be idealistic when you're 19, we're all in trouble, right? I mean, they're, you know, these 19-year-olds that have this very conservative pol and kind of statist politics because of the influence of these religious leaders who are all kind of saying the same kind of thing. Um, that's very concerning. So you would think that, that the uh, Muslim students on camp college campuses would be a little more politically radical, a little bit more, I don't know, left of center. That's not really what we've seen, in fact. So I think that's, that itself is an interesting finding. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. And part of it, this this problem is that they've created yeah. a lot of the um, stereotypes that one around. So what can those folks? So I would say the first thing everybody can do is to just understand that that you're, you're like so I have a class that's called uh, Islam and the American Imagination, and one of my things that I always start a class with is there's no stupid questions, ask me whatever you want, and so one of the questions that I always get every semester, like the first day of class is which one are the good ones? So these are the Shias, okay? And that's, that is not a stupid question, um, but it's not a good question either, you know? Uh, and so I have to, I think that's the first thing is, you know, we have to get rid of this idea that we're going to somehow find this secret organization of good, safe Muslims that's different from all the other bad Muslims, right? And I have to tell them that, you know, there's Sunnis and Burqas and Shias and Burqas. There's Sunnis in miniskirts and Shias in miniskirts. Whether you think burqas or miniskirts are good or bad is up to you, but I just want to let you know that there's not like, you can't use, the, these sectarian labels are not like a clue to anything, especially politics. Um, I mean, frankly, my mother looks like someone who would you see like in, a, in like a, in the CNN footage of Afghanistan. I mean, she's got, she looks, she dresses like Malala, you know. This woman watched every single minute of the Super Bowl. She's the most patriotic person you could find in America, and she celebrates Groundhog Day more religiously than any, any other person in America. So, you know, I mean, it's like, you, you can't look at someone and figure out their politics, for one thing. Like, that's just something we should all understand. You know, it's not like you get, Oh, well, there is some a veiled woman. We know what she thinks, you know, um, and that's exactly what the Coke ad is about, right? Um, so that's one thing, is that, you know, we need to let go of this idea that, that, we, that our job is to find the bad Muslims and see what they look like. That's one thing. The other thing, I think, is partnering with, uh, you know, Muslim students, like someone like if you're a student, you're not Muslim, but you want to partner with Muslim students and show them that, like, hey, but let's collaborate on political projects um, because actually that's where I see the most potential for more interesting political work is like you have a lot of like queer groups working with Muslim students associations because they also experience what it means to be visually vulnerable and you know to all kinds of things. So there's like commonalities that you wouldn't expect. There was like a whole thing on the Sharia band and the gay marriage bands and you saw some convergences there. Um, you know on the question of racial profiling is an obvious one. There's connections to obviously African Americans, Latinos. I mean um, on gender issues. There's, in other words there's, there's all kinds of ways to say this, this. These issues of social justice are not just Muslim issues. They're actually something that we many of us care about. We can work on it together. It's not an Islam thing. You know, like let's not pretend that sexism is just like something Muslims do, right? It's something we can all work on. Um, so I think, I hope that is helpful. Mm -hmm. um, in regards to the responsibility of kind of terrorism falling on Muslim leaders, do you see um, like new paths opening up or different ways of kind of tackling the, what the root causes, whatever that may be, of kind of dangerous extremism and things like that? Sorry, I wish I could give you a good answer. I think things are getting worse and worse because, um, you know, as the heavy surveillance uh, has the effect of all these Muslim leaders putting out fires and dealing with all kinds of like PR issues and other things that are not actually dealing with the issues in the community. This is what I was saying, and this is why I'm kind of writing this piece in my book as a kind of warning, like, look, 
you know, the, the more and more we get uh, removed from the actual debate and start having this like performed debate that, that meets the expectations of an American imagination that has nothing to do with the actual context, like we're, we're, just, we're just spinning our wheels, right? Um, and, and so I, I have to say, I, th I think that in fact, if you care about terrorism or stopping terrorism, or if you care about you know, the politics of young Muslim youth in the US, then you know, I know this is like a completely unrealistic policy recommendation, but leave them alone. Don't be up spying on them all the time. Don't, you know, it's that excessive scrutiny and surveillance and pressure um, that, that really, uh, I think, undoes all of this work. Mm -hmm. Do you think the disaffection of um, the Muslim youth you're pointing to with the U.S. government, um, for example, which is seen like along Facebook with the kind of Facebook app activism that we see, like sharing articles about drone strikes in Yemen and the U.S. government doing this and the U.S. government profiling and all these things. Um, do you think the, that disaffection of the Muslim youth is of a different tenor of just the general disaffection of, I think, a lot of uh, American youth, many who are, um, fit the more typical like, idea of American youth, like white mm -hmm. middle class, who will also say, oh, look, look at all the, <coughs> Look at all the sexism within the country. Look at all the bad politics that we have. I mean, because uh, disaffection with the American government go has like a long history. Yeah, that's just like a millennial thing. That's not just right. Yeah, I know. Right, right. No, absolutely. No, I mean, I think it's, 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 it's a spectrum and it's a continuity, but I think in the Muslim case, the, the difference is that um, a lot of times American Muslim youth have a much more intimate knowledge of like what's happening in Syria, right, than maybe most other, many of their friends who are, you know, uh, the same age, have maybe even similar politics, but just don't follow international news the same way. And so I think that it's, it's not so much that their disaffection is like a diff of a different, character or a different class or, or something. It's, mo it's simply that the sources of that are multiplied because if you care, if you have this um, vision of the world in which you're connected not just to the people on your f Facebook friend list, but also to like all these places in the world where people are Muslim and you kind of imagine yourself as being part of this global Muslim community, then suddenly when something happens in Malaysia or Kashmir or Palestine, or you know, then you care about that. And so that just becomes one more source of Frustration um, if the U.S. government's policies are you see as like you know problematic. Um, so I think that's a really really important point. It's not that American Muslim youths are like the only ones who are disaffected uh, or the only ones that can be radicalized. I mean, you know, I don't know. I, I don't see these quote unquote homegrown terrorists as of a different class than school shooters or all, a lot lots of other kinds of um, you know acts of violence that you see happening among youth, right? I, I mean, this is my own view of it. Just to follow up on that and your other comment about individualizing other cases of violence and not generalizing to good Muslims or bad Muslims, you talk about the coverage and the evolving view of the Boston bombing. Yeah, that's a, that's a fascinating case. Um, you know, first of all, the racial politics of it, whether they were white or not white, was a big issue. But to me, the most interesting part of it, and this is where I would say, you know, to, to the earlier question about how, why, why is Islam seen as different? I mean, I live very close to Newtown, where we had the Newtown shooting. Um, you know, and uh, as you may remember, the shooter uh, uh, committed suicide himself and was buried. Does anybody know where he's buried? No, I don't. It wasn't a story. If you remember with the Boston bomber, the older one who um, was killed, where he was buried was a huge national story. And it became a kind of litmus test of whether imams in the Boston area were good Muslim citizens to see whether they would be willing to let him be buried uh, or his ritual burial perform, you know, his uh, uh, funeral services could be performed in their mosque. And, and they all said no. Now, that's fascinating. So what does it mean to say, this person has done something so heinous that we cannot let his corpse in our land, right? Um, that tells us something about not just, about, about like the racial imaginary. In other words, you know, there's something polluting about a Muslim terrorist's body that's different from someone who shoots up a kindergarten, right? Um, you know, also horrible, people were horrified by the Newtown shooting. But 
nobody really cared where he was buried, or it wasn't like that wasn't an issue. So I, I think that's really fascinating, um, and that's just a, a really interesting case. Um, you know, also the inability to explain what the motive is, right? There, there's a wonderful Rolling Stone article. I think the image on the, the cover image was unfortunate because it actually distracted from what was actually a really interesting story. And I think now there's another longer piece that talks about the whole family's story. And so, you know, um, what comes out of that is that there's not any easy answers, right? The, the, the one theory was, oh, they went overseas and got radicalized. So my whole book is about Muslim kids that are overseas, not getting radicalized, but they have radical politics. So radical versus radicalized. Uh, but that story doesn't pan out. They didn't, that doesn't explain why they did what they did. And so um, to me, what's What's interesting or what's helpful about the Boston Bomber case is that if you actually look at it, what you end up with is more questions than answers. And that all of the kind of pat answers that we're used to just sort of fall apart when you start really looking at it. And so, you know, it's a tragic story. It's a hor horrific attack. I mean, I have friends that were uh, personally affected and, you know, I, it's very close to us just even in terms of space, right? Um, it's just down the street on 95 for me, uh, you know, and so, uh, you know, given all of that, I still think that we need to be attentive to the ways we think about it and the ways we, we talk about it. Uh, because a lot of these things just go unchallenged, like this whole brouhaha over the burial of, of a dead man. Right? So, anything else? Or do you want to rush in and buy my book? <laughs> um, thank you so much for having me. Oh, one last thing. Okay, okay. okay. Wait, can we do it? Okay, great. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.